Ladies and gentlemen, professor and student, thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Well, I must confess that I'm a little bit uh, surprised and even moved because uh, uh, I didn't expect to come here to give this lecture in this very university where my daughter, my youngest daughter, was student here 10 years before. And when I told her that I'm going to give speech here, she told me, Daddy, be very careful, speak loudly, don't be aggressive with the student, etc., etc." <laughs> And I said, yes, mom, I'm going to do everything you said. So, yes, really, I'm very glad to be here because this is, uh, I'm glad to have this chance to clarify before this uh, distinguished assembly of scholars and students what's taking place in the Arab world and specifically in Tunisia. I must confess also that I was very surprised by the numerous rumors and misconception spread about the uh, Arab Spring. I saw that there was a kind of prompt shift in the discourse of international observer from romantic enthusiasm to dark disappointment. Uh, gloomy predictions about the failure, the sole failure of the Arab Spring, now relabeled the Islamist winter and lamentation about the current chaos in the whole region seem to have replaced nuanced analysis. So what I want to do today is to give you try to give you a few elements that will allow you to make a more balanced assessment of the present situation. But let me, begin, let me be very clear about the danger and fallacy of the return of what we call Orientalist conclusion in face of the so-called failure of the Arab Spring. The turmoil that countries are now facing in the post-revolution context is not an effect of Islam, or of the Arab culture, but rather an effect of democracy. As Walter Clemens reminded us in an article in the New York Times two or three weeks ago, Plato, probably you know that Plato is not Arab, Plato <laughs> already foresaw and warned us of the dangers of democracy. Democracy brings chaos, and with chaos comes the desire to return to order, submission, and dictatorship. He was not talking about Egypt, he was talking about Athens, about Greece. And I think probably you remember that democracy brought tyranny to Germany in 1933 and to France in 1940. This all happened in non-Muslim context, well before the, the coup that took place in Egypt this summer. The uncertainty and dangers with which the Arab world is now struggling are inherent to democracy, not to Islam or the so call it Arab culture. This is extremely important to remember. Today, the Arab world is one of the major sites of experimentation in this type of political regime. Democracy has conquered in new areas in the Arab world, and now facing, we're facing a new experimentation of this old and new type of government. And we Arab, we are facing a lot of challenges now. We have to experiment this democracy and we have to do with it, we have to cope with it. And it's not easy. For instance, the, the, the democracy is uh, uh, just one, quick, one question, practical question. What do we do when you have a divided society between secular and conservative? What do you do when you gain election with 51% when you are Islamist, for instance? What do you do with the 49%, the other 49%? And those, the 49%, would they accept very long that you will be in charge and that ignore them? This is what happened in Egypt. This is the error made by the Muslim Brotherhood. They thought that democracy, when you, have, when you won election by 51%, then it's okay, you can do everything and can you can ignore the other part of the population and it proved to be a mistake. Well, this is an experimentation, the kind of experimentation. We in Tunisia know our problems. How to implement the nice principle of the independence of judiciary when you inherit of I would just, a lot of judges, corrupted judges, corrupt judges we who were uh, part of the dictatorship. 
uh, what do we do with this kind of uh, this kind of people? What kind of independence of judiciary can we ex expect from uh, people like this and people thinking that the independence of judiciary is to be independent towards the government, but not to be independent against opposition party, including those of the former regime. Another question. The revolution brought about free press. But once again, how do you deal? How can you organize your, this freedom of press when you have, uh, when this press is polluted by some individual involved in the former regime who confuse rumors with information and conspiracy with analysis. Like in many countries, the transparency and fairness of election is placed into jeopardy also by the question of the financing of political parties, media manipulation, and the competition amongst regions. One of the main tasks for Tunisia today is to find a way to keep up with these rights, free press and independent justice and free fair elections while containing their perverting effects, and they are extremely numerous. In Egypt, the, the, you probably know that uh, the situation is ex extremely complex, and I wonder if democracy is already dead in this country. Why? Because the so-called liberals, the so-called democrats, the so-called human rights activists backed, backed the outset of an elected president, backed crackdown on press, backed uh, um, thousands and thousands of people being, be, being jailed in the name of democracy. On the other hand, you have the Islamists now, the Islamist war uh, outset from the, from the government. A lot of them would probably uh, stop believing in democracy. And I'm afraid that this, there will be a vacuum in the Islamist trend, and this vacuum would be probably filled by extremists. This is why I, I say that the experimentation of democracy in Egypt is probably uh, a catastrophe for democracy, but I hope this would not be uh, the end of it, that once again we will resume the, ex the experiment and that we will be succeed, if, uh, succeeded even in Egypt. So you, you see that the narrative is not about the culture, the narrative is not about Arabs, the narrative is not about Islam, the narrative is about the fact that ex you have a new, uh, uh, new conquest of, the, of democracy and that in these countries, in the new country conquered by democracy, people there are, are trying to, do, to cope with this new political regime and it's not easy. But also the, the narrative is also about revolution. Once again, it's not about Islam, it's not about Arabs, it's not about culture, it's about revolution, about democracy. About revolution, uh, we are not, of course, the first revolution in history, probably not the last. I don't know, I don't know if uh, historians know, can count how many revolutions uh, have we got from the, the beginning of history. I don't know, probably 100,000, I don't know. But I'm quite sure that all this uh, revolution, they obey to the same laws, if I might say. Uh, number one, all revolution came with a price. Number two, those who initiated the revolution do not always benefit from it. It's probably the most terrible law. Third law, number three, all revolution give birth to a counter-revolution. This is exactly what's happening now in Tunisia, in Egypt, everywhere. When you have a revolution, you have the same time, a counter-revolution, and you have to deal with this revolution. Number four, not all revolutions succeed and most require a lot of time before they achieve some of the goals. One could perhaps mention the United States as an example of this, where the immediate benefits of independence were not enjoyed by, by all. So you see that we have to, uh, all, these, all of these four laws manifest themselves in the current process that are taking place in the Arab world and in Tunisia specifically. The first law, the price, we probably know that it's not the same. Play, uh, the, the, we Tunisian, we, we paid, I would say, just, just 300 and about 80 uh, martyrs, while in Syria, of course, we probably know that it's more than 100,000. Uh, 
the price is, is, is quite different. And, uh, but the price also includes not only pe people dead and wounded and so forth, but also uh, the, the situation of the economy, because when you have a revolution, uh, the, the level of expectation of the population is extremely high, and the people go uh, take to the street for all reasons. And, this, and in this situation, uh, foreign investment or uh, national investment is extremely weak, and then you have both problem of security, political process, and then deepening the economic crisis which gave birth to the revolution itself. So, uh, as I told you, all of these four laws manifest themselves in the current process that are taking place in the Arab world and in Tunisia. Uh, the revolution did come with a high price in terms of stability and economic prosperity. The economy currently is blocked due to the absence of investment from inside and from the outside world because investors are waiting for the return of definite stability. We are drawing upon our reserves. Terrorism remains a constant threat and a source of instability as the event taking place in Mali, Libya, and Syria have become a matter of Tunisian domestic politics. So the question is, will the revolution succeed? But as I told you, law number four, you, you, how can you tell that the Arab Spring now is uh, is, is that when you we need decades and decades to make such uh, a statement. So uh, how much time will it take before it achieves its goals? One thing we know is that the revolution has brought about a demand for democracy, although the ongoing crisis and threats have increased the general sense of anxiety, this demand is still very much alive, very much alive, contrary to what some commentators have alleged. The fear of democracy has not translated into a desire for the return of dictatorship. This is probably the most important thing. Yes, we are facing the side effects of this new regime, but we still remember the harsh and corrupted dictatorship we suffered from. And I think in all the Arab countries, I don't believe that it will be easy to come back to the uh, former situation. This is why I'm not sure that things in Egypt will, uh, will move the, the, you know, that I'm not going to, I'm, you know, I'm afraid to use some words here because I'm not just a professor speaking to students. I also had have state and I have to be very careful when, about some words. <laughs> but uh, even if, uh, if in Egypt now you have, uh, you have this new administration, I'm not sure that the Egyptian would accept, you know, to go back to the starting point. So, what I am sure of is that Tunisia and the Arab world is today at crossroads. In addition to all the obstacles it faces, it also disposes of a number of decisive instruments, I'm talking about Tunisia, which may aid in recovering these obstacles. Some of these instruments are rooted in long history. Now I'm going to talk about my own country because it is, of course I am, uh, this is the country I, I know. And, uh, but uh, telling you that Tunisia is probably the, the country where the, the Arab Spring began and where he's not going to die uh, doesn't mean that I'm just uh, an optimistic man. I can argue that Tunisia is among the, the many Arab countries probably the, the one where uh, democracy will probably succeed. Why? not because we are better than Egyptian or Libyan or, or so forth, but because for structural reasons. For instance, Tunisia is a small country, 10 millions, uh, middle class, uh, the middle class is extremely important. Uh, homogeneous society, we don't have Sunnah and Shia and uh, all this Christian and Muslim, all of us are Arabs, Muslim, Sunni, and this, of course, is extremely important for the cohesion and it, it makes the process, the democratic process, easier than in other countries where you have heterogeneous po population. We are also proud that we have a very strong civil society, and that since the dictatorship. When you compare to Libya, for instance, Gaddafi destroyed the civil society. He never permitted civil society to exist in Libya. While in Tunisia, even under the dictatorship of Ben Ali, we used it to have a very, very strong civil society, and this is 
probably one of the reasons that we have, uh, we have had this peaceful revolution and one, one of the reasons that we are probably going to succeed our, uh, our transformation into a democratic state and democratic uh, society. Uh, there is also another point, contrary to Egypt, we have our military is, uh, has never been involved within politics, and this is very important. Uh, another reason also, uh, currently in Tunisia, Tunisia is not governed by Islamists like uh, I hear very often. Tunisia is governed by a coalition, coalition with uh, secularists and Islamists, and this is also very typical to our experience. From the beginning, I used to say that because we have this divided society, the government should be the government of all Tunisian. And this is why from the beginning, from even when I uh, was in the opposition, I used to say we have to govern Tunisia together. Of course, together, it means moderate Islamist and moderate secularist. And this is why things are going smoothly in, in Tunisia because uh, the experience once again in Egypt, the Islamists wanted to govern by themselves just because they got 51%. While in Tunisia we said, even if we had the majority, we have to be very careful with the opposition because in transitional period, we have to get everybody on board. This is why in Tunisia, the president of the Republic, myself, is a secularist. The president of the uh, constituted assembly is a secular. The president of the government is an Islamist. And the government itself, you have secularist, and you have Islamist, and you have independent person, and so forth. And probably this is why we have now a kind of uh, uh, political peace, if I, if I may say. And the, the dialogue never stopped. Uh, the dialogue is going on. Uh, the political dialogue that stopped in Egypt, in Tunisia, is going on all the time. And this is why I think uh, this has prevented the forces of the counter-revolution whose main goal is to increase the political polarization. Polarization, that is the word I probably hate the most. We don't want the society to be polarized, polarized extremist, uh, se uh, extremist secularists and extremist Islamists fighting each other. This would be the nightmare for any, si any Arab uh, or Muslim society. What we are trying to do to, uh, is really uh, to avoid this polarization. And the counter-revolution is trying, in fact, to, uh, to make everything to polarize the, the society. So uh, I can say that uh, even if the Arab Spring is you know, facing a lot of challenges in Libya because the state is weak, because uh, uh, the civil society doesn't exist, if uh, the Arab Spring is facing a lot of difficulties in Egypt because the brotherhood chose to, to be the, the only one to govern the country, uh, ignoring the other part of the population, even if uh, the Arab Spring in, in Syria uh, became a real nightmare because of this, in fact, it's, not, it's no more uh, a revolution, it's a civil war. Even if in, in Yemen, it's also very difficult. Even if in Tunisia, it's very difficult too. But once again, it's an experimentation going on. And you have to think that we need time. Otherwise, it will be very, uh, I think, very unjust, very unfair to say those Arabs, they are not fit with democracy, and uh, democracy cannot fit with Islam, and so forth. This would be completely wrong. Uh, so the experiment is going on. Uh, with more chance in Tunisia to succeed. Probably it would take more time in other countries, but what I am quite sure is that nobody in the Arab world would, would, would accept to come back to the older dictatorship, corrupted dictatorship. We do know that if we are in this situation, it's, it's because of this kind of regime. Well, we are, what kind of regime we would like to have? Uh, what are we going to do with democracy itself? Are you going to improve it? Are you going just to, uh, uh, to behave just like other people and then waiting for the, sides of, for the, the, the side effects you know, to undermine the, the whole experiment? Who knows? I don't know. What I'm sure of is that the experiment is going on and that probably it will succeed here, have problems there, 
but we need time uh, w once again to, mm, to, uh, to, to, to kind of set what, what was the, the outcome, the real outcome. Now, before I conclude, I would, I, I would like just to say a few uh, words concerning a project that is dear to me and that I presented at the United Nations today. Uh, it's about the interne what I call the International Constitutional Court. Uh, to understand what I mean by international uh, uh, constitutional court, I would like to, to go back to the year thousand, uh, 2000 and imagine that this international constitutional court exists. Suppose this court can decide that whether an election is valid and whether a national constitution is in conformity with international law and the principle of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenants. This court has the power and legitimacy to invalidate election. It's a dream, but let's dream. This court has the power and legitimacy to in invalidate election and to determine whether a national constitution guarantees the freedom and right acknowledged by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. If it does so, the regime can be declared illegal and cannot be recognized by the United Nations. Let's now consider the case of Bashar al-Assad, who on June 20, 2000, re received the presidency of the Syrian Republic as an inheritance present from his father. Let's suppose that his case is presented before the International Constitutional Court and that the court has declared the presidency illegitimate. Maybe, maybe, I say maybe, we wouldn't count 100,000 deaths and 7 million displaced persons. And maybe we wouldn't have another powder keg in the Middle East. My dream is that one day an international constitutional court can be created and that it can prevent such catastrophe from taking place. A group of Tunisian legal scholars and judges have been working to define the way to implement such a project in the past couple of years and it has already gained the positive attention of many legal experts in the international community it's not a coincidence that this project was born in an Arab country. Arab countries know all too well what dictatorship is, what enduring threat it represents, and why it's urgent to fight it by all means. Uh, let me conclude by saying that uh, the driving power of the principle of consensus and dialogue and over the month and in spite of all crises has afforded to the Tunisian transition process, its originality, and hopefully, ultimately, its success. In the meantime, we have no other choice than continuing to struggle to achieve this objective. And as the poet Mahadu once said, the road does not exist. There is only the walking. So let's walk. Thank you. His Excellency has agreed to take some questions, and so I think there are runners with microphones, so if you just make yourself noted. Okay, we have one in the back. That you um, wanted not to have polarization in Tunisia and the ways that you were doing it, and I just wanted to add that um, we had to inspire our democracy and to inform it. We had, of course, the great minds of Jefferson and Washington and Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. But in Tunisia, you had one of the greatest minds in the history of mankind. Ibn Khaldun of Tunis in the 15th century who wrote a thousand page book on why civilizations rise and fall. And I think he could be an inspiration to all of you good people in Tunisia, your forefather, so bravo Ibn Khaldun and bravo to your wonderful efforts. Thank you. Thank you. That's not the question. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Do we have a question? There are some in front. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, we take the one in the back, but there are some in front. Hello. Um, 
Someone. All right. um, to, my question is, to what extent is the success of democracy in the region, in places like Egypt and around Nor uh, North Africa and the Middle East, important to the success of democracy in Tunisia? And what does Tunisia plan on doing to encourage the success, if anything, um, in those regions? Uh, I can correct four or three questions. Oh, uh, yes, probably. Be, 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 okay. Two or three questions. We're going to do a few questions at a time. And I'm mindful of, okay, I'm going to take a question up in there and then we'll come down. Hi. Thank you so much for coming out to speak with us today. I am fascinated by this international constitutional court that you mentioned. Um, I'm curious if you have time, if you would care to elaborate on details. Um, how long has this been in the works? And if you're planning on running this through the United Nations eventually, do you, do you have any plans for dealing with potential political roadblocks? Um, getting that through the Security Council. Is this something you see running independently of the United Nations? Um, and I wish you the best of luck with that project. Thank you. I'll take one more. Okay, we'll take one more question. Hey, wait, I think you need the microphone. But I think the person behind him has a microphone, so actually I'm oh. gonna give him the question. Oh. So uh, why in Tunisia the UGTT, uh, Union Générale de Travaux Tunisienne, is so involved in the political debate even though it's not a political party, and why the co coalition that is governing the, the country is uh, allowing that? Yeah. The first question, well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you about, uh, you know, uh, about Ibn Khaldun. Yes, we are very proud of this uh, great thinker, and uh, we, uh, we think that uh, you know, Ibn Khaldun said something uh, very important. He said that without justice, you cannot have any uh, civilization. And this is this proved true all along the history. Now about Tunisian as a model, uh, we, we, you know, once again, we, we always say that every, every country has to solve its own problem and that um, we cannot export a Tunisian model because Tunisian society is quite different from the, 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 Libyan, the Libyan society, the uh, Algerian society, and so forth. It happens that we are a homogeneous society. It happens that we are a middle-class society. It happens that we are well-educated society. It happens that we are very close to Europe, and et cetera, et cetera. And all those structural uh, uh, features make that our experience is, cannot be replicated elsewhere. But, but in fact, we, we, we learn from each other. We, uh, and I think our brothers in, uh, in Egypt or in Libya, they cannot replicate our experience, but they can learn from, from us. The most important thing we are, we are telling them is, look, when you are in transitional period, be very careful because democracy won't work as it works uh, uh, in old countries like the United States. In the United States, you will accept any president with 51%. There's no problem. In France, they would accept any president elected by 51%. But in these countries, it's extremely difficult. You have to accept that when you gain elections, it's not sufficient. You have also to broaden your uh, uh, political basis, and you have to accept that dialogue with the opposition is extremely important until we, democracy would become part of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of our culture, but this is not the case. This is, this is the, the, main, the main lesson that Tunisia could give to the other Arab countries. Be, be, be very careful, the, the, the way that democracy works in old democracy doesn't work in, in ours, we have to be very careful. And then we have to talk, our, we are experimenting uh, also the, the, the importance of the civil, uh, the role of the civil society and not on, uh, only political party. And now I come to your question, how, do, how could, why do you allow unions, you know, unions to work a political role? Because this is also very specific to our, the, this transitional period, because people would trust more unions, more uh, human rights organization than political parties. This is why, if we want to build up this democracy, we have to use all means, especially unions, human rights activists, uh, any kind of association, and not only political parties. Uh, about the, the uh, International uh, Constitutional Court, uh, 
Well, this was, um, I, I, I got uh, this idea during, uh, when, I was in, uh, when, when I was in exile. Uh, I always said that we have had a very, very strange dictatorship in Tunisia because the, the, the ideology of this harsh and corrupt dictatorship is, how could you, could you imagine? The, the, the ideology was human rights and democracy. So it was extremely frustrating for me to, to hear the, the, you know, the dictator talking every day, every time about his commitment to him, democracy and human rights. In fact, it was m merely hypocrisy. And we, we use it to have also elections, election, and uh, the, the, the dictator used it to get uh, 90, 90%, 90, etc. So, um, and we, we didn't have any, uh, any way to complain about this, uh, uh, this kind of elections. Because of course, and when you, when you have dictatorship, you, you don't have uh, a constitutional court. And this is why I have, I've had this idea. Why, why not an international, uh, international constitutional court? Because it will be the only way for Democrats, for human rights activists to complain about their, their, uh, their, their government. But when I raised the question the first time, everybody was telling, first of all, what kind of constitution we need? Do we have a universal constitution? Because when you, if you want to, to have this international court, you must have a constitution that this court would, would, would try to implement. And I said, yes, we do have this uh, international constitution. It's the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's the international covenant. It's the international law. This body is, uh, uh, can, can work as a constitution, as a universal constitution. And then, of course, it was just uh, an idea, just a dream. And I never expected that once I would, I would be elected as uh, head of state and that I would go and ask uh, the general secretary to consider the matter. And now I can assure you that it's a serious matter, that a lot of people are working on the project, and that uh, I know that we, we would need mm, something like uh, hundreds, hundred states, you know, to, to back the, the project, otherwise it won't work. And we are trying to collect in this uh, hundred states. I am uh, very, uh, have been very, very satisfied by the fact that the African Union is backing the project. Ba African Union, it's um, about, uh, for, for, I think, for 40, uh, 50, 50, uh, 50 states. So I have the half of the, you know, the needed states to back the project. But I don't have any illusion. I think it will take time. A lot of dictatorship will, will oppose the, the project. Uh, and you know, it's just like for, uh, you probably know that the International Criminal Court, it took more than five decades, you know, to have the International Criminal Court. So I don't expect this International uh, Constitutional Court to, to be set up during my lifetime. But if, if uh, mankind would, would have this uh, uh, instrument um, to prevent dictatorship in 20 years, in uh, 50 years. I hope you would see it, and then you will remember me, and they say, "Hey, he was a good guy." <laughs> uh, yes, just one, uh, three, three other questions. Three more questions. Okay. So again, I need the microphone. We'll go here, and then the gentleman who had the microphone and so carefully, so generously seated it. So we're gonna, I think we're going to take three questions and once again. Um, Mr. President, you talked about the political struggle in Tunisia, but um, Tunisia is facing a big challenge on the economic level. So, um, and I think that everybody agrees that in order for a democracy to work, there needs to be a healthy uh, economy. Do you think that the Tunisian diaspora has a role to play in this? And um, what incentives have you taken to uh, convince Tunisians, Tunisian competences living abroad to come back to Tunisia? And do you think that science, investing in science, might help in this? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Uh, quick question. Um, I lived in Tunisia in 82, and in fact, in uh, Gafsa and Tunis. Um, working with the National Arts and Crafts um, people. And um, 
question. Uh, Bourguiba, uh, sort of the George Washington, if I may say so, of uh, Tunisia. Um, how has he looked upon today? Has there been any change in uh, a historical perspective of Habib Bourguiba in light of uh, uh, the transformation in your country? Thank you. And one more question. I mean, the young lady here in the very front row. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is about the possibility of opposition. You briefly alluded to the um, forces working against the revolution. Do you think that uh, the, there's a possibility for opposition during these transitional for, times? Excuse me, for what? For. Do you think there's a possibility for opposition during yes. transitional times, or is the idea of opposition during these times is necessarily going to work against the revolution? Mm -hmm. What about the, the economic issues? Uh, as always say, we have to uh, face three challenges at the same time. Uh, the security, the, the economy, and the political process. And the th three challenges are, uh, are independent, but they are linked. S now the economy is not going well at all, because uh, as I told you, the investors, uh, not only the investors, but you have also the bureaucracy. When you have a, a transitional period, you have the bureaucracy, and the bureaucracy would, would uh, stop doing anything because they don't know where, where things are going. And this is the, probably the most important obstacle we are, we are facing now. So you have the bureaucracy, you have people, uh, you have the investors, whether they are Tunisian or foreign investor, waiting for the uh, stability, for the, the, the stable government. Uh, and meanwhile, of course, poverty is, uh, is still there and unemployment is still there. And people, because they have now the freedom of expression, now they can, uh, you know, take to the street, etc., made the situation more difficult. So we, the only th thing that we can do is to, to hurry up the process, to make the process you know, finish as, f as soon as possible, so then we can go back to the problem of economy. And of course, uh, the Tunisian diaspora is extremely important. I'll just g give you a number. I was very surprised to know that in Tunisia we have about 7,000, yes, 7,000 uh, professor of uh, university in all fields, 7,000. Half of them, half of them are abroad. Half of them are working in universities in France, in Europe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, see how, how it's terrible for Tunisians. We, we badly need this experience, and but we have half our intelligent people, you know, are outside the country. So imagine that uh, those people would help. And uh, we have had a lot of meeting with uh, their representative. I, they said that they will probably do everything they can to uh, promote uh, Tunisian sites and so forth. Now about the, the opposition, as I told you, we have to deal with the opposition, we have to respect the opposition, we have to work with the opposition, we don't have any other, other choice, otherwise they, would, they could block the, uh, the, the whole process. Uh, of course, uh, we do know that part of the opposition do not want the process to go, to, to go forward. Uh, part of, of the opposition is also part of the old regime, etc. So we have to dis distinguish between um, the, the, the spectrum, the wide spectrum of, of the, the, the opposition and to work with, once again, with the moderate part of the opposition. Because many of them, you know, we're friends of, we're, we have been colleagues, we have been friends, we know each other and so forth. And now the danger is the, the extremists, you know, the, the, the old regime and probably the, the sometimes people, you know, we would like to uh, say we want everything just now and they, they, they do not understand that we need time, that it's more, much difficult than they, uh, that we are also with social, social justice, that we want people to have jobs, et cetera, et cetera, but we cannot do just like this. And uh, we, have, we, have, we, have nav, we do not miracles. We do politics, but not miracles. Uh, about uh, Habib Bourguiba. Habib Bourguiba, I don't know if you know this man. He's the father of the nation, and uh, he, uh, he built the state, uh, but uh, he was not exactly what we can call a democrat, and this is the main problem with, the, with this uh, the father of our nation. Uh, w Tunisia is, uh, can be grateful to this great man for three principal reasons. F first, 
he really put education first. Yesterday we have in the United Nations a meeting about uh, the slogan, education first. Bourguiba, since the, uh, the independence 50 years ago, put education first. And if I am here, if I am, uh, if I, it's because of this uh, policy, because I come from a very poor family, and I think th thousands and thousands of people of Tunisia can say that if they are now what they are, it's because Bourguiba, because of this policy of education. Uh, second, Bourguiba, I think, has had a, a, a important influence on uh, gender equality. You know, if we, we in Tunisia now, women are uh, extremely advanced when you compare them to other Arab countries, it's because of uh, Habib uh, uh, Bourguiba. But the main problem with this, uh, with this uh, great leader is that he was deeply convinced that democracy is not good for Arabs and not good for Tunisians at all, that they, they need a strong leader and they need a father, and the father has to be very uh, tough with his children, just but tough. The problem uh, with this kind of, uh, of uh, you know, conception is that uh, when you have honest men like Bourguiba, it can work. But when you have a corrupted person coming after him like Ben Ali, then it doesn't work because this, uh, when you have uh, uh, this authoritarian regime, it means that you will have what we have during more than three decades, corruption and corruption and corruption and then uh, everything. When you have this diseases, nothing would, fa would function. And the only way to prevent corruption in the world is democracy, freedom of exp expression. You can denounce the corrupted people, uh, independent judiciary, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody has found any other kind, uh, uh, better solution to the, the problem of corruption than democracy. So when he left, you know, he was overthrown by his prime minister, Ben Ali, uh, because he was too old. And uh, we've moved from an authoritarian regime to a corrupted dictatorship. And this led to the revolution. Now we are back to the heritage of Bourguiba, education first, gender equality, uh, but no more uh, to this conception of the strong man, the man, the, the father of the nation, uh, who have to be just and tough with ch children. We are no more children, we want to be citizens, and this is extremely different. So this is the, probably the most important result of revolution. We want to be citizens and nothing else. We want to be citizens in a free country and no more depending of the, you know, of this great man, of this other great man. Is it okay?